Right, well, I'm the even more novice surgeon um, speaking today. Um, Brian Schallenberg, I'm a senior resident at uh, Scott & White in Temple, Texas, and just thank you for having me. This is a privilege. I'm gonna be speaking about uh, learning M6 in residency, so I have the opportunity to do that. Um, as a resident, I have absolutely no financial disclosures, sadly, um, but today we'll be talking about uh, methods of incorporating M6 in residency as well as a special pitfall specific to the resident. Okay, my first M6 experience was um, here. We took this tiny, tiny plane uh, down to Mexico and we went to the state of Sinaloa in El Fuerte at the mouth of the Copper Canyon. And right there is actually a few months prior, they had just caught El Chapo, the infamous drug lord. So fortunately, everything ended up okay. Um, then here's my uh, first uh, start to finish case with my firstborn. And so it was, a, it was a very great time. And since then, I've been able to do it more and I've done it at my home institution. I've got a few cases scheduled at our VA where folks in Central Texas tend to get some hard cataracts. So. Um, so methods. Uh, one, uh, find a mentor. Uh, that, that I think this is key, especially for the resident, someone who's experienced, who can get you out of trouble um, when you get in trouble, and then also someone with a willingness to teach. I actually encountered some people um, both here but also in the mission field that um, kind of, they wouldn't say it outright, but came across as saying they didn't really think residents should be doing this, but I was fortunate enough to have someone who taught me that said, you know, this is really, I think, no different than any other surgery as long as you stay safe, you learn the steps, you have someone with you and, and go from there. And so you can have a program attending or schedule a one-on-one -on -one trip with someone would be great, or in my case, I happen to have both, so still, still working with him. All right. Uh, express interest during residency. I think this is important because not all programs in, incorporate in this in, into their curriculum. And so this is a time to learn, so get after it. And um, it's also a way to improve your program. There's more and more uh, fellowships popping up for international ophthalmology, and this can be actually a draw to improve your program, attract good residents to say, hey, this is something we're doing as well. So you can see it as that opportunity too. <laughs> um, be a go-getter in residency. I think this probably goes without saying, but you don't want to be the baby bird waiting to be fed. And especially with M6, you don't want, um, in a lot of places, it's just not going to come naturally. You may have to seek it out somewhat. And then you can find patients who would benefit. Like I was saying, there's a few patients scheduled right now where uh, you know they may have a cataract that would benefit from this rather than FACO, like the, we've spoke with other um, speakers today. Okay, Ideas for program leadership for incorporating this is to incorporate it directly into the curriculum. Our program has an international missions ophthalmology week where uh, Dr. Nathan Henson, which I'm sure some of you know here are all, um, and Dr. Dan Gold come down and they teach us for a week. They hold a M6 wet lab. It's probably one of the highlights of our program. And um, they also talk about other things regarding uh, international ophthalmology, worms in the eye and so forth. It's a, it's a great time. Um, program leadership can coordinate with nurses and OR staff to keep expired materials from your OR. We've got a ton of viscoelastic, which is great because pig eyes tend to take a lot, and so we've got all that on hand. Uh, request for donated materials. Lots of companies, industry seem happy to donate stuff when they know what it's for and what you're learning. And also, invest. they can invest in M6 practice materials. So we, we have a box available where we can grab it any time we want after hours or, and um, practice M6, and so it's a lot of fun. And then, so that brings me up, practice, practice, practice. Everything's new in residency, and so getting as much practice as you can. If you have access to a simulator, that's wonderful. Um, we've got a bunch of pig eyes, um, so watch videos. Um, you've got all of Dr. Google at your disposal, so do that. Read about techniques, um, and we're gonna talk about more of this later, but incorporating techniques that you're, you're confident in um, can help when you're starting out. And then a few practical practice tips is you know, if you don't have the simulator, you can use the Voodoo ophthalmology head there. Um, but I find this, it's a little bit difficult to use. It's hard to maintain stability. It's messy. It can, it's a little creepy. Um, so you can use uh, one of these eye mounts, which it's extremely useful. Uh, just suctions the eye in place for you, and it's, it's real easy to clean. Um, it has this little syringe, and it's real tempting to 
really suck that eye down to, to work on your tunnel and get the eye nice and tight, but you will have a, an expulsive once you open everything up and, and you'll get the lens out, but not the way you want it to. So I found that about three to four cc's is a good amount of suction to have a, a, a steady case all the way through. And you can put the little clamp on. Uh, don't make the rookie mistake of leaving that off. And if you live in Temple, Texas, you can go to the middle of nowhere and some guy named Jim will get you a bunch of pig eyes. Um, so if you don't have this at your program, you can call around and uh, apparently it's a butcher that has to have a killing floor. Um, but you can get the eyes and uh, it helps to have documentation if you've never done this before so they don't think you're a deviant of some sort. Um, but I, I feel like pig's eyes are better than cows. They're, they're more appropriately sized. And um, post-mortem eyes are good, too, from humans, but they're difficult to obtain. But you see it has all that periorbita still attached. Um, so one thing I've found that is if you cut all that off, leave a little bit on the back, and it can really suck down better. But the main purpose is for cutting that off is once you do this, you're going to put it in the microwave for eight to nine seconds and give it a cataract. So you can go from here to here and you're no longer doing a clear lens exchange on a pig, which is really helpful for the resident because it really helps with the uh, nuclear expression I found. Um, but don't go longer than nine seconds because you will be spending longer than nine seconds cleaning that microwave. Um, <laughs> but uh, just know that uh, the most important thing is when your program director comes to you, very concerned because you have access to his office, you just, and he says, Schallenberg, which microwave did you use? You just say, I plead the fifth and, and move on. So you're all set up and good to go. And it's a lot of fun. So special pitfalls for residents learning the technique. We, like everyone so far has mentioned, there's disappearing skill sets in ophthalmology. We don't, I mean, I have never done an ECI and um, a little bit of tunnel experience. Um, I know I've talked to other people who said they had to do 10 ECIs prior to starting FACO, and it seems like more and more that's not the case. Um, but there's a remedy for this. There's a few attendings that still do scleral tunnels, so approaching them to staff your normal cataracts can be great to get tunnel experience, very similar. But if you don't have that, I found that trabeculectomy seemed very sim similar in their approach, even uh, getting the, the tunnel. Um, and then practice in the wet lab nuclear expression. We just, we don't have the experience with the ECI. And so the nuclear expression, it seems like most residents, we want to scoop that nucleus out, like taking um, uh, dirt out of a hole with a shovel. And I really felt like it felt more like taking my foot out of a boot. You gotta press and pull it out. And so it's just a different feeling, um, but one that, that's uh, helpful to practice on a lot before going to a human for sure. And then find the crescent blade maneuver that works for you. Uh, it seems like um, resident struggle with this is, I, I had one resident friend who he said he kept struggling with the, the initiation of the, the crescent blade in the tunnel. And um, he was going this way and they're telling him to go that way. And one other doctor just came up and said, why don't you try right to left instead of left to right. And then it worked every time for him. So some people flip it over, some people bev bevel in and just do what feels comfortable. And then another thing that was helpful for me is uh, who taught me was the, the wiggle versus the waggle. And it's probably, I never heard of that because I hadn't done many tunnels, but if this is my crescent blade and that's a wiggle, this is a waggle. And so it helped me to stay in the plane and not have problems with early entry or exit. And so that was helpful. Um, setting up for success. So this picture I think exemplifies residency is we can be well-intentioned, well -intentioned, think we know what we're doing, but we've just got it all set up wrong and it can cause some serious problems. Um, so learn one step at a time. One thing that was very helpful is I saw a bunch of cases by my mentor and then he would bring me in for individual steps to, to have that success um, and see how it was done right um, and build on itself. Start with virgin eyes, good dilators, people who don't have a trab in place and so forth. Um, that's always good. Have help close by. I, when I went to Mexico, it, you know, it was not chaotic, but much busier than I was anticipating. And, you know, people were asking for things. And um, so it's just good to have them help by when you're in trouble. I didn't have a, an accessory scope where I was, so my uh, staff was real uh, relying on me to let them know, you know, hey, can you take a look at this? And he would ask periodically as well. So that was great. Um, and know when to hand the instruments over. It's, you know, to swallow your pride and say, okay, it's, it's, it's time for them to take over, and that's okay. Um, residents can get overwhelmed by new maneuvers. This, everything's new, and there's a lot of new stuff in this procedure. 
So something that I think is helpful is incorporating what you're already comfortable with. Use calipers. This was helpful to, um, instead of holding the blade up there, which is great to figure out your incision, you know, starting out, maybe dehydrate the cornea a little bit and measure it straight out. Start with a straight incision and then progress later to the frown was helpful. Um, start with a, a large CCC on a, a good dilator and then later on progress to can opener since we're used to doing uh, CCCs on our, our normal cataracts and residency. Uh, try using the Simcoe on a normal cataract case. Uh, surprisingly, I found that lots of ORs here still have Simcoes, so our, our main institution and our VA, and you can, you can hook it up to your, your FACO, or you can ask to hook the irrigation from the FACO and then get the syringe, or the, the syringe as well and try that out before using it. I think it's a neat little instrument as well. So. And then put safety before material conservation, especially as the resident. Residents tend to feel like they have all eyes on them all the time. The medical students, the other residents, the attendings, the nursing staff, the OR staff. And so you might um, try to cut corners by and compromise safety by not wanting to use an extra tube of viscote. But it's okay. Ask for another one when you're, when you're this early in your uh, career. Okay, and then don't feel bad about asking for a new blade. I think there's nothing more nerve-wracking or frustrating to a resident when they feel like they're operating with a spoon. It's just you feel very uncomfortable pressing on the eye so hard, so getting a new blade is good. Um, only, this is something that only uh, a resident can ask themselves or all surgeons is, is having the right motivations why are you doing this and uh, people have already addressed this today, but you know, avoiding the God complex of I'm going to go here and fix these people, um, but also specific to residency is the numbers game. There's a plague among residencies that more surgeries equals better surgeon, and you know it's more more high quality, great surgery is is better surgeons. And so avoiding the idea of well, I'm I want to go on this trip because I'm going to get 60 cases here versus whatever. And so don't try not to think that way. And we have to respect and love these patients. They're not. They're not practiced because they're in developing worlds, and you know I, I, I constantly have to remind myself, even in the United States, of this because sometimes there it's thought of that uh, you know the residents operate on VA patients, and no, no, this is someone that uh, deserves the very best as well. Um, be humble because residents may have not experienced those life-altering complications yet. So. Um, this is my daughter, my beautiful daughter, and uh, my wife, um, uh, beautiful wife, and I have one on the way. So this, I really think, is the most important pitfall for a resident is respecting and loving your family during this busy time. Um, residency is often harder on your family than it is for you, and you have to view your free time as sacred because there's very little of it if you're not in clinic seeing patients in the OR, if you're on call, preparing for grand rounds, it's just there's not a lot of free time and so it's hard going to your wife and saying, well, of our three vacation weeks, I'm going to spend two of them in Africa, that might not go so well. Um, so, but there's remedies for that. Um, programs actually have educational time and leave, including funding. We have something called Project Vision that can help pay for this as well because there's not a whole lot of money involved in residency too. Um, but that's, that's an option and something to investigate so you don't have to take away from, from that precious time. And then consider weekend mission trips. Not all of them are a month long. Mine that I went on in Mexico was actually only four days long and we went there and flew back and so it was, it was a, a good thing to do. And then going forward, I'd like to include my family as much as possible. I think it would be great to have my daughter along when she gets to the appropriate age and, and something fun we could do for, uh, together. But thank you so much for your time. Yeah, questions.